everybody. Um, I promise to rapid fire one more success story before we can all have some lunch. Um, I want to just gauge a little bit for a second. How many people in the room work for a governmental entity? Raise your hands. How many people work for an NGO? Uh, engineers in the room. Um, scientists, ecologists, biologists, blue field geomorphologists. Good. So I feel like we have a good mix of different people that come from different backgrounds. Um, and I want to talk about a project that ha is in an urban river system. Um, so Laura, your question is apt, and I think there's some pictures that should speak to, to your, uh, your concern. Um, the, uh, Save the Sounds program goal is to make all Long Island Sound healthy for fish and wildlife. And that is um, a goal we try to achieve with our river restoration work. Um, we're fighting an uphill battle that's a little different than other parts of the state. Is this stretch structure? I don't know what's going on. Um, that was not the intention. Can you help me? There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have touched anything. <laughs> project and we're continuing to work on that site. We also work on um, streamside buffer projects, green infrastructure, living shoreline projects like that um, and try to think holistically about watershed restoration. Uh, the project we're going to talk about today is in the West River in New Haven, Connecticut uh, in the central part of, of Connecticut. Um, it's a coastal. Um, these are, this is an, an, a list of all of the entities that have been involved with the Pond Lily Dam Removal Project. And I point this out because each of these entities brings something different to the table and is interested in this project from a different perspective and a different reason. Um, and so there are a lot of different partners, a lot of different stakeholders in this and I think many and mo maybe most successful projects. So um, I, it was really, it's really fun to be involved with a bunch of different folks like this, um, but it is also a juggling act, and um, I think project administrators definitely are like herding kittens for most of their lives. So, uh, in this particular dam, in Ponlily Dam Removal, the two reasons went the, for the impetus of the project in, um, in about 2009 were for fish passage and flood resilience reasons. Um, Fish passage, um, at the time, the uh, NOAA Restoration Center was a major source of funding, and so connection to NOAA Trust resources was really important to get any significant funding dollars in the region. Um, and then the town of Woodbridge, which is actually upstream of the city of New Haven, where the dam is located, um, there's a low-lying section of town, and they were really having a flooding problem. And so they were interested in seeing if this dam removal would help that condition. It, in fact, didn't help significantly, but it was a really dedicated group of people who became interested in the project above and beyond the, the benefit to them personally for the dam removal. However, if you, if those of you who are involved with municipalities, the Municip this dam was located in New Haven. The municipality who is now supporting and funding this potential, you know, this design for the dam removal is a different municipality upstream and a wealthier municipality at that. So that was definitely something that had to be worked out um, and was initially a, a source of, of concern for the entities and, and really suspicion until everyone got to know each other. 
The first time that we know of that anyone suggested dam removal at this site was in 19, after 1982. Um, this, is, this was this area of New Haven. Um, there was a very significant storm event and, um, and Whaley Avenue flooded, many, many homes flooded. Um, at that time, dam removal was mentioned but not, not implemented. Um, but the, the West River was significantly channelized. There was a lot of of um, uh, Canadian baskets, a whole lot <laughs> in the system. Um, and then in 2011 and 2012, Connecticut um, and, and New York and the East Coast really had gotten well up a couple different times. And um, as a result of that, there was actually sort of more funding available for projects like this and more interest in moving this kind of project to completion. Um, so these are sort of two different key moments in the history of this project site and why, um, why we were able to move the project forward. Uh, so I want to talk about some challenges and, uh, and then some opportunities for urban river restoration. Um, as I mentioned, culverted, channelized, buried rivers impacted in a lot of ways. We have impaired conditions, we have uh, TMDLs, we have combined sewer overflows, stormwater outfalls, we have nutrient issues. Um, we have potentially polluted sediment, although not at this particular site, the, the levels aren't that high, but this is major concern. We have upstream infrastructure. Here we have a town bridge, a local bridge, a sewer line, and all crossing within the, the upstream impoundment, plus adjacent homes and businesses. Um, the owner of this particular site is actually the New Haven Land Trust, and um, and so they do not they do not have money for this project. They also don't necessarily have money to for, to protect themselves um, against liabilities that are associated with a dam in an urban environment. Um, as you saw in the a few slides ago, there were a lot of stakeholders, so there's potentially conflicting interests about what to do and what is most important um, on a site like this. But with an urban site, there aren't only challenges. I think there are real opportunities. Um, and yes, sorry, project We all know that. Um, so, in this is this is an interesting thing of. of of, uh, unique to New Haven and the West River watershed. This is a land cover map of uh, the West River watershed. And so the dam is right here. <laughs> so once you remove this barrier, um, uh, herring are able to um, access a much more or much less impaired watershed than they find in urban New Haven. Um, so even though you're, you're you're, we're operating in a very urban condition. There's um, there's a lot of, of potential for um, for those fish to really access uh, uh, a much more pristine condition. Um, talked about reducing temperature, dissolved oxygen, improving sediment transport. Um, in this case, mitigating flood hazard. That's often a benefit in an urban environment. Uh, public safety. Um, in this area, this is definitely an, the case of an environmental justice, really creating an urban oasis for people and wildlife. This was a big, big deal for the owner. Um, that were actually, the pond was really almost 100% of what the property was. And so now, uh, in the post-dam condition, we can, really, people can really access it and interact with, their, well, with this waterway in a way they hadn't been able to before. Um, Many stakeholders can be an, a challenge, but it can also be an opportunity. There's a lot of people um, who want to come out to the site. We have cleanups here all the time, and there's always a lot of interest in getting people out. And high visibility can mean an educational opportunity. Um, this site, I, I think, was, it was funny. In, in, in 2011, we had a public meeting, and, and a lot of people didn't really know, um, didn't know what what dam removal was, what it meant, what it mean flooding for them. And then when the dam came out finally in, in, uh, in late 2015, people knew what the name of the dam was, they knew what alewife were, they, they had, they had, I mean, I think though that lag in design permitting can be a blessing and a curse. People have a real chance to get used to what the project is about. 
Um, and so that was definitely true here. There's people sort of walked out of Walgreens and turned around and said, oh yeah, I think I, I've heard of this project before. Um, and there, so at, when we had our planting event, um, there was uh, 140 people, including 70 Quinnipiac University students, um, who came out to help. They may or may not have been, been uh, voluntary, some of them were voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another real opportunity uh, in an urban setting is really these local partners that, that um, and the more local the better. Uh, you know, you think, say the sound, our office is in New Haven, we're local, right? No, 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 these kids live behind the, the, the dam, they're actually adjacent to it. They, Solar Youth is a program in New Haven that does environmental activities with, with youth, and so they now have, uh, use the trails next to the, um, next to the, uh, the nature, Connelly Nature Preserve. Um, that's uh, the, uh, President of the New Haven Land Trust, the dam owner, getting his hands dirty and really interacting with this site, which they uh, were not able to interact with before. Yeah, so just to give a timeline, um, I'll go through this quickly because it is similar to Sally's. You may notice some, some the big dis difference, the take home message is the, the length of project development, design, and permitting relates as it relates to removal. Um, once you get to removal, it's, it's much shorter. Um, there is a whole lot of planning and involvement and design and permitting that goes into these projects and projects in an urban environment that increases exponentially. Um, I think two sort of moments that were really important in this particular project as it relates to community and uh, urban restoration. One was congressional attention. This is our Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Um, in 2013, um, that, um, that was and so that was funding that led to funding for construction of this project. And then the other, we, we worked on a West River Watershed Management Plan with the West River Watershed Coalition, and um, this was a really big benefit to this project. I think that um, there was a regular steering committee meetings related to that process, and we were able to report on the progress of the dam removal project. So if there's any opportunities for a project you're working on to to have a co to involve yourself in a coalition in that way, um, I think it's a really interesting. Right? It was a really interesting um, match for us that we were able to add that um, add that on as sort of a, a meeting agenda item, and it wasn't such a intense single public meeting where you might you know get things thrown at you or something. Um, so now I'm going to show some pictures, and you guys can go to lunch. So here's the dam breach. See, uh, this may have been the culprit, let's see if I have a better picture of it, of why the dam didn't fail. <laughs> There's actually a solid concrete cutoff wall in the very center of it, which was, it, the thing was completely undermined. You could stick a six foot skater rod into, six feet into it, and, uh, and the only thing that was sort of holding it together was this cutoff wall and the water from underneath it. There it is now. Big yellow machines in the river is a satisfying thing. Um, so if you look at this picture on the lower right, you think we're done, right? The river is done? Well, we had a similar situation to, to Sally and had to, um, uh, our permit showed something different than what what the river wanted to do. And so it's now our job to convince everyone to and fund and, and <laughs> to redesign and the, you know have the engineers work the engineers to redesign, repermit and remobilize the project uh, with you know based on what conditions we're seeing there and that adaptive management I think is really critical. And that's the pictures. Here's some pictures of what the site looks like now, and I wanted to especially to address I guess uh, Laura's comment about vegetation in an urban setting. Um, we did uh, use a seed mix, a native seed mix, on this site because of the urban setting. However, um, and my colleagues Anna and Elsa are back there, they were out monitoring vegetation at this site just a week or so ago, and we're really not seeing a huge amount of invasives overtaking this site. Um, there is some purple woostrife, but for the vast majority of vegetation we're seeing is native, and it is 
highly vegetated. Mm -hmm. I'll show you some pictures of that. Were there any pockets of invasive vegetation prior to the dam removal? Um, yes, there is. There, I mean, there was there was uh, purple loosestrife. There wasn't any Phragmites on this site. Um, there is Japanese knotweed downstream, but there isn't in the impoundment now, and there wasn't previous to the dam removal. Um, there's also some black locust on the site. There's actually this runs along Rayleigh Avenue, which is a very yeah, there's a street, of and there's uh, sort of a historic flood control berm, and so the town maintains the berm, and the berm is entirely Bittersweets and with um, Japanese knotweed, we are not seeing great encroachment from that into the impoundment. Yep. So you didn't, did, did you also have to do anything with like sediment mitigation there? Um, so initially, this was one of the major changes that happened from the design to when we re redesigned. Maybe kind of like 3.0, I think. We, um, instead of doing a lot of sediment management, um, there you can actually see right here, there's a ripple, constructed ripple, and then there's a constructed ripple on the um, upstream end of the impoundment as well. And um, that sort of, that channel was setting up on its own, and so instead of, of dredging out a channel in its different location, uh, we reinforced the ripples at the locations we were seeing them and allowed for sort of natural sediment over time. Uh, this site is so funky. Every site is different, right? And so there was a whole bunch of water willow holding the sediment in place. And so though, as they break down, it's sort of letting this very funky sediment release over time, but we're not getting a, this huge release of sediment. Um, also this year, we've had really low water, so um, sort of every year, we site is a little bit different, but. And related to this, how, how flashy is this stream? I mean, do you have? It's, there's um, <coughs> reservoirs upstream. Um, and so there's this, it's, this site, there's about um, 2.7 miles of habitat that um, that we access from um, from here upstream and including a, a significant um, pond or lake. Um, but upstream of that, there is a reservoir, so there is some um, elevation control, so it's not as flashy as maybe some other systems would be. But I think I just have some lessons learned for you guys, but I'll take questions. Uh, if you would like. Um, just many, yeah, many, many perspectives, multiple benefits. Um, urban, urban sites are very challenging. Um, I think there's really opportunities for job creation, community involvement, and urban environment. Um, find your local, local allies. Like if they're next door, would be great. Uh, and uh, vegetation does bounce back and take pictures. <laughs>